أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولقد آتينا إبراهيم رشته من قبل وكنا به عالمين إذ قال إبرا إذ قال لأبيه وقومه ما هذه التماثيل التي أنتم أنتم لها عاكفون قالوا وجدنا آباءنا لها عابدين قال لقد كنتم أنتم وآباؤكم في ضلال مبين قالوا أجئتنا بالحق وأم أنت من اللاعبين قال بل ربكم رب السماوات والأرض الذي فطرهن وأنا على ذلك من الشاهدين وتالله لأكيدن أصناكمكم بعد أن تولوا مدبرين فجعلهم جذاذا إلا كبيرا لهم لعلهم إليه يرجعون رب يشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه إجمعين ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Today we're at Surah Al-Anbiya, the 21st Surah of the Quran and we're going to talk about uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam again from ayah number 51 onwards. Another important section that tells us some things about Ibrahim alayhi salam's career. The last time we, uh, the section that we were dealing with from Surah Al-An'am, we learned some things about how he, uh, you know, arrived at his conclusion and how he demonstrated that conclusion to his people and to his father. Now we're actually going to see other passages of the Quran that zoom in on each of those audiences. So. There's going to be another passage where he's going to have very direct interaction with his father, specifically with his father. And there's a, spe- a special passage where he's, you know, uh, addressing the society at large. So I've chosen to go with the passage where he addresses society at large first, and then we're going to deal with the other passage where he deals with his father. But there's wisdom in that, that Allah Azza wa Jal highlighted that as human beings, when we speak up for the truth, when we follow the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam, there are levels of challenges. And there are people that we have to engage with in the outside world, right? And we have to declare our message and stand up for what we believe and not allow someone to silence what we actually believe and not be afraid of it, not be ashamed of it. That's one side of it. But it can also be that what you believe is not acceptable within your own family that or within your own inner circle, right? And you're being silenced or suffocated for what you believe within that. And so... Ibrahim alayhi legacy addresses both of those challenges and what comes with that. And they, they each have a different obstacle. So what we're going to see today is when he's challenging society at large. And, you know, you don't have to be a public figure or somebody who's always engaged with thousands and thousands of people. But we all have work, business, school, right? You, you deal with non-Muslims and people that, that don't believe the same ideas as you do. And now because the world's become one giant social media web, you know, people are commenting on the same material from all over the world, right? People of different beliefs and different views. And the, the, the commentary space, that exchange space has become a very immature, aggressive, hostile kind of space where like normal conversation becomes almost impossible, right? Um, and there's a kind of mob mentality, right? So, and it's interesting that a lot of social media giants uh, fuel that by... Uh, allowing hearts and angry emojis and you know so you can you can gauge how how many people are being angered and how many people are like and they're pitting people against each other and emotions against each other so when get, somebody gives a thumbs down other people jump on them and say oh yeah you're one of those guys and they they, they come at them so there is such a thing as a mob mentality there is such a thing as the power of a large crowd and how intimidating it can be you see that play out in different parts of the world, even in the United States sometimes. But you know, for example, the kind of uh, hostilities that are happening towards Muslim women in India nowadays, for instance, for wearing hijab, right, or at universities. The kinds of things that Muslims have faced, for example, in Sri Lanka that we don't hear much about, right? So there are, there are um, you know, and this is not just, and I'm not to say that only Muslims face this. People face this all the time. 
But Ibrahim alayhi salam's story is going to be not just about the rights of a person, but it's going to be actually about the rights of Allah. Right? He's not standing up for his rights, actually. He's saying Allah deserves to be talked about in a way that is honest. Right? So it's not about himself. You know, usually when you see people speaking up, uh, they're speaking up for a particular interest group. And even Muslims can become an interest group. Muslim civil, civil rights, you know, Muslim liberties. And that's a legitimate cause, just like any other civil liberties are, are a legitimate cause. But that's not what's being talked about here. What's being talked about here is actually your faith. What is it that you believe? And why should you be, you know, uh, why should you be, be silenced uh, against what you believe? So we're going to start reading this from, again, Surah Al-Anbiya. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ رُشْدَهُ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَكُنَّا بِهِ عَالِمِينَ And we had already given Ibrahim السلام, his uprightness from much before, and we were fully aware of him. We fully knew about him. إِذْ قَالَ لِأَبِيهِ وَقَوْمِهِ When he said to his father and to his entire nation, مَا هَذِهِ التَّمَاثِيلِ أَلَّتِي أَنْتُمْ لَهَا عَاكِفُونَ what, what are these... Tamathil, I'll translate that in a second. What are these tamathil that you people sit in, in front of in devotion? So tamathil comes from the Arabic word tamthil, which comes from mathal. Mathal is actually an example or an equivalent. Uh, tamthil becomes a representation. Okay, a representation. So this is interesting because for, for those people, they didn't necessarily worship the idol, but the idol represents a god that is somewhere and that God has these powers. It's not this idol. You could break the idol and they know that too. But these idols represent something more, right? And then the amulets that they wear or the, the, you know, the, the trinkets that they might put in their car or you know, the amulets that they might tie around their arm, they represent something, right? So they could say, yeah, this is just a piece of string. It's just a piece of leather or whatever it is, but it represents a, a supernatural deity behind it, right? So... This is Ibrahim alayhi salam challenging a common thread that exists in many religions, which is what we take physical objects and we say this physical object represents something supernatural. It represents some kind of God. It represents some kind of superpower, right? So you might find a manifestation of that with, you know, with Catholics wearing a crucifix and it's a holy thing that they're wearing. They're going to kiss it. They're going to keep it. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll find in some parts of the world drug dealers that are devout Catholics that are you know, before they go into a drug deal, they're going to kiss their crucifix and go in because, you know, or they're, they're going to pray to a certain saint that's going to watch out for them while they make sure that, you know, the narcotics distribute in the society properly, right? So, but you have this notion that objects become holy, right? Um, you can have, you know, in, in the United States for many hotels, you'll open up the drawer in the, in the side drawer of a hotel room and you'll see a copy of the Bible. You know, or the Book of Mormon in many, many cases, right? Uh, and it's not because somebody will read it necessarily, but it's also part of the blessings of it all. Or you'll see like a crown in the back of a car, you know? And the thing is, Hindus do this, Muslims do this. I I've told you a story before. Our neighbor back in New York when I was in high school, um, old lady, she was going to, um, uh, what's that place past, uh, it, it's somewhere in New Jersey, uh, the, the, the gambling city. I'm forgetting the Atlantic City. So she's heading to Atlantic City to gamble because it's their thing. They go on the weekend to gamble, right? And she's going out and she drops a picture frame from her bag as she's walking out of the apartment. And it was Ayatul Kursi in a picture frame. And I was like, is she taking shahada? What's going on? So I picked it up. I gave it to her. She goes, why do you have that? She goes, oh, I take it with me all the time. It's for good luck. You know, so, so the idea is that, you know, this is something that pagan religions have done all along. What's crazy is then what Muslims started adopting. So then we started hanging like a microscopic copy of the Mus'haf from the windshield of our cars because we couldn't afford a car that has dual side airbags or, you know, because like, this is better security, you know. Or we'll, we'll you know, it, it became an industry. It used to be an industry in other religions. People used to sell this hocus pocus to take advantage of people. And then this came into the Muslim world. Many parts of South Asia, Southeast Asia even. You can go to somebody who's really connected to Allah. You can tell by the disheveled hair. And you, you go to them and say, well, you know, I've, I've, you know, a couple goes to them and says, we've been trying to have a baby. We can't have a baby. And he'll just say, oh, okay, we'll write your names down on this piece of paper. He'll dip that piece of paper in some water. You let the ink you know, go and he's do some hocus pocus, you know, sing some Barney song in his head. I don't know what he's going to do. And then he's going to say, now drink this. And then he'll turn an amulet and put it around your arm and don't take this off. 
and you'll have twins, you know. So, and people pay good money for this. People actually pay good money for this, right? And this is actually uh, something that, in the end, it comes down to this kind of thing. People just turn to religion to get their wishes answered, right? And the, the craziness of it gets to the point where the Muslim can go to the house of Tawheed. They can, we can go to the Kaaba and you have Muslims cutting up little pieces of the ghilaf, of the, the cover of the Kaaba, the Kiswa, right? And then bringing it home and, you know, like this is a piece of cloth. This is a piece of cloth, you know. That, those, those stones that were used to build the house of Allah are stones, our deen did not come for the worship of stones or to make stones sacred. And this is, this is a really important thing that we have to internalize. Just because we're Muslim doesn't mean we're, we're free from that. We have to be like Ibrahim alayhi salam. Things have to, you know, these things cannot represent something sacred in and of themselves. It is the beliefs and the belief in Allah azza wa who is beyond these things that is sacred. And so he questioned his father and said, What are these representations? What are these things that you think represent something powerful that you sit in front of, that you have such reverence for? You know, that you're sitting and, you know, i'tikaf is when you go and you devote yourself in worship. And they're, they're doing that, right? There's, they can sit and, you know, be concentrated in worship, eyes closed, eight hours at a time. They can do that. They would do all kinds of long, long, long hours of worship. And so he put, a, he put a question mark to that. Now, another side of that that I want you to know is that, okay, the world after, you know, post-colonization, post-industrialization, post, you know, the, the, you know we're, we're, we're post, post the new modern age, right? We're in this new, new age where, yes, there's a huge chunk of the world that's still religious, but, a, you know, many big cities were beyond religion. So most big cities in the world actually have very similar sociologies, right? The, the houses of worship are not full. People are working, you know, nine to five kinds of jobs. And they have, even if they're different religions, they all have similar kinds of goals. They all want certain kinds of house, certain kinds of car. You know, they want to be able to enjoy their weekend in certain kinds of entertainment. Like for the most part, if you go to, whether you go to New York City or you end up in London or you end up in Sydney or you end up in Jakarta or you end up in you know, downtown, you know, whatever Muslim country, you know, if you end up in Karachi or anywhere else, you're going to find similar things, right? Lifestyles have changed. Yeah, the dressing of religion on top of that is a little bit different. But you know what? Some things now became uh, new gods. And that's what I really want you to take away today. The old gods used to be idols that represented something. They represented happiness. They represented protection. They represented these kinds of things. The new gods are you know things like uh, how much money you have in the bank or what degree do you have and if you don't have this degree you're worth nothing if you don't have this kind of job you're worth nothing if you don't live in this kind of neighborhood that's your object of worship everything you do is so you can move into this neighborhood right these are these representations are now our ultimate goal like what, like the way somebody would like die to or or struggle their entire life to make it into jannah we have these concepts of man when i get here that means I have achieved, uh, you know, Jannatul Ma'wa. I've, I've gotten it. Because this, these letters are next to my name now. Or this, you know, this, I have this kind of a house. The kind of house that I can make videos about and post. And people can say, whoa, seriously, look at that view. You know, those things have become now a kind, a kinds of representation. Then the other thing that's become the new God that I've been referring to, I want to drill that in your head also, because we have to counter it is the self, the nafs has become a kind of God now, has become a representation. So my happiness is the ultimate objective. My, the, me feeling good is the ultimate objective. Nothing can get in the way of me feeling good, you know? And so if that means that I have to be addicted to video games because I want to keep getting dopamine hits by crushing candy, then that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to stay on it and stay on it and stay on it. You know, if, if it means that I have to keep putting more and more, you know, fake images of myself online and represent myself a certain way to build, then that's what I'm going to do. Ibrahim alayhi salam is taking something the entire society is obsessed with and saying, what is it that you're spending so much time on? What is this? Why are you so sitting in devotion in front of these, these tamathil? I, I love this word tamathil that the Quran used here because it, 
it targets what Ibrahim a.s. was targeting, but it targets all the tamathil that will come after him. Like for ages to come, we're going to have different tamathil. Like we have different tamathil now. You know, how many studies are there now about people that are that are suffering from social media addiction? They can't get off of it. How many people are now extreme levels of, you know, the, the, the low self-esteem, low self-value, all of it associated with the, the addiction they have to these, these devices and these, these comparisons, this new obsession with comparison. And we're just sitting before them and we're, you know, hoping that we can make it to Jannah, meaning we can have this many followers. That's our Jannah now, you know. So he said, and what, did, what was the answer that he got? We'll just talk about these two things today. Qalu wajadna aba'ana laha abideen. They responded, we found our fathers worshipping these things. I told you, we have to, when we study Quran, we have to understand the history that it's coming from, and then we have to compare it to the reality we're living in. And only then do you understand what is, what is the Quran actually telling us in a timeless way. You know, to understand this, it'll take five minutes. Back in the day when people used to spend the last two days before they leave Hajj, right? When the last couple of days before we leave Hajj. وَذْكُرُ fi ayyamin ma'dudat. Remember Allah in the few days, that at, at the very tail end of Hajj, right? And you can stay, you know, وَمَنْ تَعَجَّلَ فِي يَوْمَيْنِ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ وَمَنْ تَأَخَرْ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ لِمَنِ اتَّقَى Whoever wants to stay a couple of days, they can stay a couple of days. Whoever wants to stay longer and remember Allah, they can stay longer. Now you're sitting there, you're not praying, but you're just remembering Allah, doing dhikr, doing dua, etc. But you're all together, right? So eventually you start kind of having conversations. And people start talking about where they're from, what they do, etc., etc. Or if they're with their friends, friends talk about common interest. Allah says, in those days, he says, This is, please pay attention to this point. He says, Remember Allah the way you used to remember, the way you remember your fathers, or even with more intensity. Remember Allah the way you remember who? Your fathers. Now, back in the day, for the tribe, remembering your father and what your grandfather did on the battlefield, or I come from this tribe, my father did this, and my, our, my uncle did that, and this was the thing to talk about. This is what they were big on. But now, we're oblivious to our fathers. We're oblivious. This is not the culture anymore. You know, this was the culture back then. Your pride was associated with your father and his father and his father, and in tribal societies, that makes a lot of sense. So if you visit a, 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 you know, a traditional tribal family in any part of the world, Muslim or not, you're going to see people taking pride in their father and father, grandfather and so on. And now in, in the modern world, you ask an average child, tell me something about your grandpa. I see him on Eid. What else? Uh, he's old. He's pretty old. You know, <laughs> he talks funny a little bit. We don't know nothing. We, that's not the source of our pride. But what is, it? what is it that you can have a conversation with with a young man or middle-aged man that will like fire them up? Or you could talk about the stock market. You want to have a conversation about cryptocurrency. You want to talk about you know cars. You want to talk about games, devices. You want to talk about politics. There are things that like really fire people up and they really want to have those kinds of conversations, right? So when Allah was talking to the original audience, He was talking to them about what's, what was culturally relevant to them. But what we can learn from that is we need to extrapolate that and say, well, what is culturally relevant to us? Because it's easy for me to live by the ayah, literally, I'm not going to go there and talk about my father and his father and his father and his father, so I'm, I'm good with the ayah. I'm not, I'm not violating the ayah. I'm going to talk about video games instead. I'm going to talk about, yo, you watch this YouTube video, this is really funny. You know? That's, but I'm violating the ayah. Because that was for them, you see? So the same way here, when they answered, they said, we do this because our fathers did it. We do this because our fathers did it. Why are the fathers? Because you have the most respect for who? Your fathers, back in the day. You know who you have most respect for nowadays? Celebrities, athletes, popular people. Or what? my favorite word, everybody. Everybody does that. What do you mean? Have you ever seen somebody not doing that? Look, everybody's doing it. Look at all these people that are so popular and successful. They're all doing it. They've become, they've become our Abba. <laughs> They're the new Abba. You understand? So when they said, when Ibrahim Ali questioned them and said, why are you worshipping these idols? They said, because our fathers did it, and their fathers did it, and their fathers did it. But yes, in, in terms of raw religion, that may be true. This was passed down. But actually, the new false gods that we're worshipping, we've accepted new fathers too. New elders too. 
And we look at these influencers and these celebrities and these people that set these trends and they define what is acceptable, what is normal, what is to be celebrated. And we give that as our justification because we've accepted them as the ideal to want to be like. That's Once you accept that, then of course they're going to set what is normal and what is not, what is good and what isn't, you know. There's a reason these people get paid big, big bucks to put product placement in their videos so that, you know, people like you and me that are just worshipping their status can go buy the same product so we can feel a little bit closer towards them. Forget Al-Qurb ila Allah, it's Al-Qurb ila celebrity. You know, that's, that's what this is. So here Ibrahim alayhi salam is actually challenging cultural trends. Cultural trends. And you cannot, I cannot be a, a genuine representative of Millat Abina Ibrahim, the religion of our father Ibrahim alayhi salam, if I don't understand what these trends are, I don't understand what these new idols are, I don't understand what the force behind these idols is, the influencers behind these idols are, so I know that when people are worshipping this stuff, where is it coming from? From their own mouth. Our fathers, we saw our fathers worshipping this stuff. So obviously we're going to worship it, you know. When one celebrity is going to say, oh, I wear this or I drink this for my morning breakfast or blah, blah, blah. How many millions of sales are going to go up, you know, because of that endorsement? Just a little bit, you know, because we worship these things now. This has become a new form of worship. So may Allah Azza wa protect you and me from it. And may Allah Azza wa really allow us to see the world from the, in the way that Ibrahim alayhi salam used to see the world. That is actually what Allah Azzawajal wants us to develop, the eyes of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the heart and the mind of Ibrahim alayhi salam. This is why it's the religion of our father, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikri al-Hakim.